Today, the property signs for the 2nd of July 2021. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In today's show, we look at the latest home price indices, we look at the latest lending statistics, warts and all, examine why mortgage settlement times vary so much between lenders, and the claims that responsible lending rules are to blame, and also some issues at Westpac. But first, According to CoreLogic, national home values rose 1.9% in June, taking annual growth to 13.5% for the financial year. The growth in Australian dwelling values was led by houses, which rose 15.6% over the year, compared to a 6.8% lift in unit values. Now, just remember this, these property indices are relatively useless insofar that they're averaging across different locations, different types of properties and all those things. You have to go grand here to really understand what's going on. So this is of limited value, but nevertheless, core logic continues. This is the highest annual growth rate seen across the Australian residential property markets since April 2004 when the early 2000 housing boom was winding down after a period of exceptional growth. However, there are some markets where performance is starting to ease more notably, Eliza Owen said. Each of the capital cities saw an uplift in dwelling values in June, ranging from 3% in Hobart to a more subdued 0.2% lift in Perth. The performance gap has narrowed between regional Australia and the capital cities, though regional Australia did outperform slightly in monthly growth terms, rising 2% through June, compared with 1.9% across the combined capital cities. Darwin maintained the highest annual growth rate across the capital cities, increasing 21% in value over the financial year, followed by Hobart at 19.6%. And across regional Australia, regional New South Wales had the largest annual growth in dwelling values at 21.1%, followed by regional Tasmania at 20.8%. Now, it's just, of course, worth recalling that prices in Perth peaked in 2011, 12, 13, drifted down considerably over recent years and then moved up, whereas, of course, in Tasmania, prices have been strong for the last few years. So again, it's very important to compare these movements, not just on an annualised basis, but over the longer term as well. Mazowin reaffirmed the strong demand side factors underlying the growth. Before the recent uncertainty of growing COVID-19 case numbers, there were plenty of demand side factors driving housing market growth through the first half of 2021, she said. In May, the unemployment rate fell to 5.1% and the underutilisation rate fell to 12.5%. That's the lowest level since February 2013. But of course, as we've discussed, those numbers are rather flawed in any case. Consumer confidence remained elevated through June, although down from the recent April highs. Elevated savings accumulated through COVID restrictions last year along with a more confident consumer sector, has encouraged consumption of larger goods such as housing. This has all occurred against a backdrop of continued low mortgage rates, which is one of the most significant demand drivers. In other words, it's all about credit. Credit and the availability of credit is by far the most significant factor driving the performance of house prices. In addition to these strong demand conditions, Mazowin noted total advertised stock remains relatively low. The latest listings count from CoreLogic indicates that in the 28 days to June 27th, total advertised stock remained 24.4% below the five-year average. This dynamic of strong consumer demand and low housing supply continues to create some urgency among buyers. Despite another month of strong gains, there are signs that some heat is coming out of the market. The monthly change in Australian home values of 1.9% sits well above the decade average, which is 0.4%. However, this month's growth rate 
is down 30 basis points from May 2021 and 90 basis points from the recent peak in March 2021. The only capital city to see a further increase in the monthly growth rate was Canberra, where dwelling values were 2.3% higher over June compared with a 1.7% gain in May. Across the capital cities, a loss of momentum was most evident across Perth and Darwin. For Perth dwellings, the monthly growth rate in values had averaged 1.4% between January and May, but fell to 0.2% through June. And across Darwin, the monthly growth rate in dwelling values averaged 2.1% between January and May, but was just 0.8% through June. The key to understanding the softer performance of these resource-based markets may be a slightly different supply-demand dynamic compared to other capital cities and regions, says Mazowin. CoreLogic monitors a sales-to-new listings ratio, which divides the monthly volume of settled sales by new listings brought to market. For the past three months, the sales-to-new listings ratio was 1.1% across Darwin and Perth, while the implication is that there is 1.1 sales for each new listing, which could be enough to elicit further growth in dwelling values, these are the lowest sales to new listings results of the capital city markets. Softer growth rates are also emerging at the high end of the market. Across the top 25% of dwelling values in the combined capital cities markets, growth in dwelling values in the June quarter was 8%. That's down from 9.2% in the three months to May. And while this 8% uplift was still the highest seen among the value tiers analysed, the growth rate had also the largest month-on-month -month deacceleration. According to Ms. Owen, this easing in the pace of growth at the top end of the market is another sign of a shift in momentum. The rest of the market tends to follow movements at the high end, and this is the first time in nine months that the high tier growth rate has not accelerated. And it's also worth recalling that Home Builder has now been turned off and some of the COVID support mechanisms have also been turned off. Of course, the real sleeper is what's going to happen to interest rates, because if interest rates are going to rise more quickly than expected, that could definitely turn the market around quicker. And as I discussed yesterday, there are some signs that interest rates may have to move sooner than was originally expected. The ABS just released the new housing loan commitments, which rose 4.9% in May 21, season adjusted, to a new high of $32.6 billion. And that was driven by investor housing loan commitments. The ABS said the value of new loan commitments for investor housing rose 13.3% to $9.1 billion in May 21, which is the highest level since April 2015. The value of investor loan commitments rose 116% in the year to May 2021 after falling to a 20-year low in May 2020. And investor loans equated to 28% of the total value of housing loan commitments in May 2021, compared to 46% in 2015. This reflects the very strong growth in owner-occupier loan commitments over the last year. The rise in investor loan commitments was concentrated in New South Wales and Victoria, which rose 12.1% and 17.4% in May 21. And new loan commitments for owner-occupiers rose 1.9% to $23.4 billion, and that's the highest level since the series began. However, for the third consecutive month, there were falls in the value of loan commitments for residential land and the construction of new dwellings. While the number of loan commitments to owner-occupier first home buyers fell 0.8% to 15,050, it still remains at historically high levels. First home buyer activity remains at the highest levels in New South Wales and Victoria. However, the number of first home buyers has fallen over the past few months in Queensland, Western Australia and South Australia, following the cessation of home builder and state government initiatives such as the Building Bonus Grant in Western Australia. And the value of new loan commitments for fixed-term personal finance rose 5.6% in May 21. That was driven by lending for road vehicles, which rose 4.7%, and lending for personal investments, which rose 11.6% 
followed by a 25.2% rise in April. Now, it's worth just reflecting here because the Reserve Bank has argued that nothing needs to be done with regard to taming lending because it's mostly owner-occupied. However, this data suggests that in fact the growth is now pivoting towards investors, which means that we're now back in speculation land. So time, I think, to bring those macro potential controls into play. Elsewhere, banking industry executives have argued in favour of a refresh for the responsible lending laws, reporting dragged home loan approval processes and negative hits on small business owners. And the Standing Committee on Economics has also sought clarity from several non-major bank CEOs as to why there is a huge range in broker turnarounds between major and non-major banks. On Thursday, the 1st of July, the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Economics spoke to several CEOs of the non-major banks to discuss lending, their work on deterring anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing, and competition in the banking space. When appearing before the committee, the CEO of ING Australia, Melanie Evans, was asked by the committee's deputy chair, Dr Andrew Lee MP, member for Fenner, how the bank had been able to consistently deliver speedy turnaround times when major banks had not. So, Chief Executive Officer of ING. Um, so you're probably better placed than anybody else in the country to uh, answer the question about differences in loan approval times. Um, the February 2021 Broker Pulse survey found average time to initial credit decision for ING was four days, uh, equal first, along with Macquarie Bank. Uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum, we have Westpac at 20 days. So Westpac is taking five times as long as ING uh, to approve loans. Uh, and uh, I, I hear that, uh, that a lot of that really blows out for, for uh, people who don't have an initial, uh, any ongoing relationship with the bank. Uh, that is, they're, uh, they're just turning up fresh. Uh, and given that possibly you're getting more fresh faces in your door than Westpac, that would make the comparison look even worse for Westpac. Uh, why is it that Westpac does so badly compared to ING in terms of time to initial approval? Let me talk about ING. Um, that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, I'd say a, a few things there. Um, this is a metric that matters to us and it's something on which we compete. I, I said in my opening remarks that we pride ourselves on being trusted and by providing exceptional service to customers. And so there is no more important metric, although there might be a few others that come into to certain customers um, decision set than um, giving them a firm view about whether or not they're able to buy the house, upgrade, enter the housing market. So it is a number that um, I dare say we obsess about. We make sure that we resource our teams appropriately. We've spent significant time um, with those members um, of our own team who are responsible for that process making sure that our back-end systems, our data, our use of digitisation, uh, and most importantly, our use of communications with customers when they're going through the home loan approval um, means that we can provide that certainty more quickly. Uh, but forgive me for pushing you a little on this. I suspect if we'd had you before us in your previous role at Westpac, you would have said much the same. Uh, home approval times are important to us. We invest in technology. Uh, we aim to iron out the bugs. Uh, and yet ING is succeeding in that, doing it five times as fast. Uh, and there does seem to be a sort of disparity when I look at the kinds of institutions that are up the top. Uh, so Macquarie, ING, Adelaide. Uh, but then down the bottom, we've got uh, you know, Commonwealth Bank at 15 days, ANZ at uh, 17 days. St George 20, Westpac 20. What is it systematically that's going on? I suppose I'm asking you to not only talk about what ING is doing, but also what on earth is happening in the sector that has such a, a huge spread between the best and the worst performers? I think there's a number of things I would hypothesise that drive those differences. Um, the first is how important that measure is to you. So we have our, in, our mortgage operations team onshore here uh, in Australia, 
that means that if that cycle time or, or time to yes time starts creeping out um, well beyond the three to five days, we're able to move other team members who are cross-trained uh, in providing that service into that workflow so that we can actually manage our customer experience. So uh, if you are committed to that number and you're managing it tightly, then you're making decisions about where you're putting your money and your resources uh, and ensuring that you're aligning those to, I guess, the processes or customer experiences uh, that matter the most. We also um, very quickly on in COVID were able to um, benefit from the use of digital signatures. So um, we had a program or a digitization program going on in the bank that was already looking at that. So when the changes were made that allowed us to move to digital signatures, we pretty much turned that on straight away, which meant there was no snail mail or, or no scanning and sending of documents that we moved to that digital signature for home loan approval very quickly. I'd compel the committee to look at what we can do in terms of the settlement process as well, because I think we can all make that an easier and more simple process for customers uh, too. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, I'd say um, there is probably um, a composition of customer base um, sort of theme here that might be that might be, I guess, driving some of those differences. But to be frank, I haven't turned my mind in great detail to it. But but definitely depending on how complicated your customers are, how ready they are to go through the application process, um, that can absolutely drive whether or not the customer gets it right the first time or needs to resubmit and, and things like that. So I'm sure that has something to do with it as well. So uh, I certainly get that uh, a smaller organisation can be a little bit more nimble when it comes to ironing out the processes. Um, my guess is there's another big factor which you're quite politely not drawing attention to, which is that Westpac has more, much more of a captive market. Uh, so existing customers with a banking relationship with Westpac are putting in an application for a Westpac loan and waiting to see what Westpac says. Meanwhile, uh, there's another bunch of customers who are approaching a whole lot of organisations of which ING is one, you're in a bit of a race for their, uh, their, their, their uh, custom. And if you don't move quickly, then you're likely to, to lose their business. Does that sound fair to you? You would have to ask the leadership of the banks that you're referring to why they're not moving as quickly as the rest of us. We Later on in the hearings, two other non-major bank CEOs were asked about turnaround times when it came to excessive delays in discharging loans. The committee noted that the ACCC final home loan price inquiry report released last year had recommended that existing lenders should take no more than 10 days to discharge a loan. The CEO of SME lender Juno Bank, Joseph Healy, was then asked whether he would urge the government to act on this recommendation because the government has yet to respond on that report. The ACCC last November brought down a report in which it said that if you're refinancing, then your existing lender should take no more than 10 days to uh, approve the, uh, to, to discharge the loan. Um, you've said that for Judo, uh, the typical delay is 52 days. Yeah. Uh, would you be urging the government then to act on the ACCC's recommendation? Yes, I would. And this is this is not a problem specific to judo because after the media comments I made a, a month or so ago, I was approached by several ba smaller banks and non-bank lenders who, who shared the exact same frustration. It's anti-competitive behavior to take almost 60 days to do something as simple as providing a settlement figure and a discharge of the existing security, allowing businesses and consumers to make choices of transferring to other lenders. So. The delay. Yes, you quote uh, Hotel California there. You can check out any time you like, but you can't ever leave. Mr. Weston, do you agree? Uh, I, I do, and, it, and the same applies for home loans. And uh, uh, quite often, um, a customer will go to a mortgage broker and say, I want a better deal. Uh, the first thing the broker will do is get on to the existing lender and say, can you give a lower rate? And the lender says, no, we can't. Uh, and so the broker goes and helps the customer refinance. And that takes 
time and they wait three weeks or whatever to get a, uh, an approval and uh, then request a payout figure and a discharge of mortgage from the incumbent lender. And the incumbent lender hands the matter uh, after a couple of weeks to their retention team. The retention team will phone the customer and match the rate uh, they couldn't uh, a month or so earlier. And of course, everyone is frustrated. So uh, there is a way in our case, you know, and not only can we approve uh, mortgages for a, uh, a reasonable percentage of customers in, in you know, 15 minutes, uh, we can uh, discharge the mortgage for a number of lenders uh, within two days, within a day, uh, using a different method. And that is you don't wait for the payout figure, you pay them out and you write to the bank and say, we have paid you out, please prepare the discharge of mortgage. And that's only come about because of the delays uh, in discharge and the frustration with retention teams coming into the play at the last minute. And they also grilled a number of the non-major banks alongside industry body Australian Banking Association, the ABA, asking about the government's proposed repeals of responsible lending obligations. The bill, currently before the Senate, would scrap responsible lending obligations for lenders under the National Consumer Credit Protection Act, with the government claiming that this would simplify the credit process. The Senate recently pushed back on a motion from the Green Senator Nick McKim to discharge the bill from the Senate notice paper, which would have forced the government to scrap it altogether or start again with its amendments. While Anna Bly, the chief executive of the ABA, denied the body is actively campaigning for the repeals, she did say it would welcome any changes to the laws. Around responsible lending laws, we've got uh, new lending for owner owner occupiers at record levels in Australia. Uh, there's a lot of credit flowing and it's difficult for me to see that there is any problem of lack of credit in the residential home market. We also know that the watering, watering down of responsible lending, lending laws is basically friendless on the Senate crossbench. There's not a single crossbench senator that's come out. One Nation, Jackie Lambie, Rex Patrick, the Greens and Labor have all been critical of the attempt to water down responsible lending laws. Surely in that environment, the ABA should cease its campaign to axe responsible lending laws. Uh, I'm not aware of any campaign uh, being run by the ABA. Uh, what we have said is that the current laws are laws with which banks are and will continue to comply. And should the government through the parliament uh, change those laws, uh, then there are part there, we would welcome any changes to laws that would make the approval process, the application and approval process, faster, smoother and easier for customers. Uh, whether or not those laws change is entirely a matter for the parliament. Uh, bank, or through the ABA, they have said they believe that the proposed changes, um, it's not so much related to the supply of credit. I completely agree with you. There is ample supply of credit going into the market. Uh, it is about the um, impost and the process and the efficiency of the process and the speed of the process for customers. Uh, it is the view of the ABA that uh, all of the responsibilities of um, prudent lenders can be met um, in a world that is rapidly changing when it comes to um, data uh, and access to information about customers, that we should be getting smarter about it. Um, you know, these laws are 10 years old, having a look at them and updating them, it's not a bad thing, but it is entirely a matter for the parliament. If the parliament changes the laws, then banks will um, adapt their processes accordingly. If the parliament decides not to pass the laws, then banks will continue to comply with the law as it stands. I'm just not sure it's a good look for the Australian Banking Association in an environment in which credit is flowing freely to households to be out there campaigning to water down consumer protections. Bank of Queensland CEO George Frazes rallied for the proposed responsible lending reforms, claiming it would, quote, simplify process for both personal and small business customers. Barriers that responsible lending laws are put into BOQ and its capacity to be able to service its customers. So, Chair, um, the starting point is that responsible lending laws uh, are directly impact personal customers, but I'll have to say it does also impact small businesses, which is uh, a point that sometimes is missed. And that is because for very small businesses, which we, you know, is a big part of our, our banking operations, the, the personal and the business requirements of that customer are interlinked and are blurred. And that creates onerous processes for those small businesses to actually um, get credit to either 
uh, support their businesses or grow their businesses. Uh, what we're proposing, uh, what we, we're supportive of the changes. Firstly, we don't think it reduces any customer protections. It does simplify in terms of having primarily one regulator, which is APRA, deal to responsible lending uh, requirements, which are already there in terms of the requirements from, from APRA. And I do want to stress that from our perspective, lending standards have remained high and will continue to remain high. And our objective will always be to do the right thing by our customers. The issue with responsible lending laws at the moment is it does require onerous um, reporting of information that even as a bank that we've had a long-standing relationship with that customer, we're required to ask those questions again. So it does create quite a burden on our small businesses and also our personal customers that have been banking with us for some time. Robert Keogh, CEO of Beyond Bank, was a little more muted in his response, saying the bank supports the principle of responsible lending, but it's important not to overcomplicate the lending process. And in terms of um, the uh, regulatory environment, we had BOQ who were before us this morning saying they were strongly supportive of the government's efforts to reform responsible lending legislation to make it um, uh, put them in a better position to be able to support their customers. Do you have a view? Um, look, we'll always, we're owned by our customers, so whatever we do has to be in support of our customers. Um, we are supportive of doing the right thing around uh, regulation to, uh, to, for organisations to operate under. Having said that, we're also mindful that we do not want to um, create an environment where it is actually very, very difficult to, to work with customers. Our current approach is that we sit down, they own our business, so therefore we have to support them in every way that we can. Our objective in our assessment process is to understand them firstly, understand their needs, and then go through an assessment process, which is about their income, which is about their expenditure and their living expenses, which is about what they're trying to achieve, and whether um, the, uh, the product that we have on offer uh, is appropriate for them. So in that regard, uh, you know, we're very supportive of responsible lending uh, obligations. However, um, we also believe that uh, we need to be mindful about um, we, the fact that we do not uh, overcomplicate the process of lending. While the broking and property industries have indicated support for the reforms, Labor and Green Senators, alongside crossbenchers, have pushed back, with naysayers including Senators Pauline Hanson, Rex Patrick and Jackie Lambie. However, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg has stayed firm on the bill, insisting that as the country recovers from the pandemic, now is the time to wind back the obligations. And once again, we've got this same fur fee. Just to be clear, if the responsible lending obligations were removed, there would be no real protection for consumers. It would all be down to what the consumer said. The bank would be able to take it at face value and then come back and clobber them later if they got it wrong. And the point about the alternative processes that have been offered as a solution, the Ombudsman effectively, that only deals with a particular case post something going wrong. It's not a structural remedy. So to my mind, removing responsible lending laws would be a major disaster. And I hope that the Senate stands firm against the Treasurer on this one. And I still believe, and some of the evidence that you heard, I still believe that some of the banks are still advocating for this in lieu of dealing with their true issues, which are actually process issues within their organisation. The fact of the matter is, many have not invested in the digitalization of their processes, are highly inefficient, and they're using the responsible lending issue as a mask to stop them having to deal with the real issues that they should be dealing with. Elsewhere, ASIC says that Westpac has committed to remediating customers whose financial advisors may have failed to notify them of corporate actions between 2005 and 2019. Westpac estimates approximately $87 million will be paid in compensation to affected customers who are former clients of Westpac's advice businesses and held AXX-listed securities through their platforms. Corporate actions cover a range of activities by publicly listed companies, including buybacks, 
renounceable and non rebounceable rights issues, share purchase plans and takeovers. Westpac's failure to notify customers of corporate actions means customers may have missed out on various opportunities. Those include purchasing additional shares, often at a discount to the market price, the creation of temporary rights or options that can be sold for a profit, and the ability to sell shares and receive a benefit that can be tax advantageous depending on the shareholder circumstances. Westpac's remediation covers an estimated 328,000 potential missed corporate action notifications, impacting approximately 32,000 customer accounts. This is a complex remediation due to the various types of corporate actions involved. Westpac aims to compensate most of those affected customers by the end of 2021. Customers will also be informed of missed corporate action notifications where Westpac has determined that no compensation is payable. Compensating customers affected by misconduct is a very important part of licensees obligations to act fairly, honestly and efficiently. We are pleased to see that Westpac has taken action to remediate affected customers regardless of how much time has passed, said ASIC Commissioner Danielle Press. We encourage affected customers to engage with the communications from Westpac to understand how they were impacted and to seek further information from Westpac if required, Ms Press said. As it encourages all advice licensees and platform operators to consider their corporate action management arrangements and to ensure customers who are entitled to receive notifications of corporate actions are notified appropriately. This is particularly relevant when platform operators have arrangements with financial advisors and advice licensees for them to pass on information about corporate actions to customers instead of the platform notifying customers directly. Platform operators may appoint custodians to hold legal title to customers' investments, including listed securities. As the listed securities are not held in the customer's name, communications about corporate actions from share registries do not go directly to the customer, and when the platform operator receives notifications of corporate actions in respect of those listed securities, depending on the specific arrangements, some operators pass on that notification to the investor's financial advisor or advice licensee. Westpac first reported its failure to notify customers of corporate actions to ASIC in July 2019 and provided further information on the scale and significance of the issue in April 2020. And on the 14th of April 2020, Westpac issued an ASX announcement that included provisions for corporate action remediation. Westpac's advice businesses involved in the remediation include Security Financial Group Limited, Magnitude Group Proprietary Limited, and Westpac Banking Corporate, known as BT Financial Advice. These businesses ceased providing personal financial advice back in 2019. So here we have another litany of failures amongst the major banks in terms of handling specific issues once again. And once again, of course, the corporate regulator has been caught flat-footed and is trying to deal with the remediation post the events. But I want to highlight again that these business processes inside these large organisations are actually often flawed. And once again, putting more reliance on just the systems to try and solve issues may not work. Now fold that thought back into the early discussion about mortgage origination processes. Systems may help, but there's a broader cultural issue that needs to be addressed. And my belief is that these large organisations in particular are still way off the pace in terms of their cultural norms. And that comes from the top, not from just tuning processes a little at the bottom. Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultants standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high, price discovery and price transparency are hard to find, and then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience, knowledge and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer.
I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.